Thank you, David. And yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I have to take off afterwards to go back and cook for a uh, wife and two children, but it's good to be able to get out every now and again um, <laughs> after five o'clock. So yeah, as David said, I'll basically tell you a little bit about my story, um, probably starting halfway through, through the life and just share three um, sort of experiences I've had um, with you. Um, the first was um, when I was uh, leaving school, I guess, and thinking about what to do, you know, with my life, as we probably all did. And um, I'd always had, like, back in my mind, I should be a doctor. Like, my dad was a doctor, and, you know, I thought, be a doctor. But it was pretty quick after maybe, I don't know, a month of med school, I was, like, looking around at everyone thinking, they just want to be a doctor for sure. Like, they've got, like, the next 20 years of their life sorted. And I'm like, damn, I don't know if I can do this for the next, you know, year, let alone... Um, 20. So I uh, left medicine and then went to do what the career advisor told me. Um, you're good at math and science, go do chemical engineering. So I did <laughs> chemical engineering. I lasted two years that time. I think it was, I don't know, I guess slightly more, maybe I don't know, less sure of what I was going to end up be uh, doing in terms of chemical engineering. But it came quite quick to me that I actually wanted to do something that I felt like I had some sort of direct control over, I guess, in terms of, yeah, and I guess the, the talk today is all about, I suppose, the theme of me being wanting uh, to be a change maker. And so I uh, decided to start my own business uh, instead of working or uh, uh, studying engineering. And so I bought a cafe restaurant down in Dunedin. Anyone from Dunedin or studied in Dunedin? Cool. Mm -hmm. So I, I owned a cafe down there called Modex, uh, which is in the middle of High Street in Dunedin on George Street. And it was through the work at that business and a charity I founded at the same time that put on music festivals that I got a chance to like just have total control. Like in other words, if I wanted to open the cafe at 11 o'clock was I, you know, gone out the night before I did it. And I guess that sense of, um, yeah, being the person responsible for things, I, I guess I enjoyed. And it gave me a chance to, I suppose, start putting in practice what I felt quite strongly was that the way that businesses ran and the way that I guess the future of the world was going, I felt was probably not quite the direction that I felt ultimately people wanted it to go. In other words, there was you know, issues around, this is 20 years ago, so issues around environmental stuff were becoming more prominent, you know, um, issues around uh, equality and things. So I decided to try and use my business and this charity to actually start practicing those things myself. But even when you have 5,000 people at a big music festival trying to get them to separate their recycling, you know, you end up feeling a little bit like, hmm, maybe I'm not sort of hitting this thing at the sort of, um, I guess, more systemic level. And so I decided to quit my job, I quit that role and go back um, to university. And I uh, went to Vic and did a master's in economics and environmental studies. And then, I don't know how they hired me, but they, I got hired by the Treasury, so a <laughs> ex-music festival, you know, cafe owner from Dunedin, um, walked into Treasury, and I was there um, for six years. And as David alluded to, I mean, I worked on the, I led the, the welfare reforms, the investment approach to social investment stuff that's now around the government quite a lot. Um, worked on international climate change, so I tried to negotiate the Copenhagen deal, which never happened. Um, and it was all around how we'd measure the fair effort for people. So it was trying to use principles of what, what emission reductions did New Zealand do, what should America do? And um, again, that made me feel like relatively hopeless, I suppose, in terms of government, I think definitely has a role for sure and they're an important contributor. But when you're sitting in the United Nations trying to solve climate change, it felt a little bit like. So around that time, I was like, I've got to do something else than just try and think about policy being the solution. So I worked four days a week at Treasury and then the other day, set up conscious consumers. And the thing that I left Treasury doing as I sort of moved on to work conscious consumers full time was, um, I remember the chief economist coming into uh, a meeting with me and my manager, and he said, look, Treasury is all about living standards, but like, do, do we actually think about living standards for all New Zealanders, not just average GDP? And I said, well, forget about what about average GDP, what about all the other social, cultural, environmental capital issues? So we started, that was in 2011, working on this living standards framework, which was published in, uh, later that year. And it was seen, the OECD published a paper around the same time, and Joe Stiglitz and Amartya Sen and uh, others had written a paper uh, in 2009 called effectively how we should make a measure progress in society. So what should we look at doing in terms of not just GDP? Anyway, that OECD picked three countries or three examples 
um, including New Zealand. And we were taken, and I had dinner with Joe Stiglitz and Marty Sand sitting around in a room to talk about, and there was only about 15 of us, like how we can set effectively government um, policies or government frameworks towards things around well-being more than just um, growth. Um, and I don't know if you've heard, but in the last few months, um, I think Jacinda got up and said, look, New Zealand, we're going to lead the world in how we measure progress in societies, and we're going to use Treasury's Living Standards Framework for that. So that feels good, and um, that's one thing that I think I left as a seed. But conscious consumers in one minute is like, I quit that job in government, even doing all that stuff, because I knew that this thing that we've built is going to change the world more than any government ever will. And it's effectively a data platform. So you think about all these data companies, Facebook and whatnot, like, they don't use your data to change the world in ways that you care about. We do that, and we allow you to make a vote for workers, to make a vote for the climate happen every time you swipe your card. So thinking about BNZ, every time you swipe your card, you can be sending a vote to the businesses you're buying from about the issues that matter to you. And our platform then tells you stories of businesses that are changing their behavior in ways that matter to you. So you and me, and together, we can change the world. Thank you. Thank you.